welcome everybody. We are here to hear House Bill 1648 relative to the home cultivation of cannabis plants and the possession of certain cannabis infused products. It's called uh, Representative McGuire. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm uh, Carol McGuire. Is that better? No. Nope. Yeah, no. You just pull the red button. Push the red button, it'll stay down. And then it should work. You don't have to touch it. Recording session. Okay. I did press the red button. So I think you have to put it on your mouse. The microphone. Okay. Is that better? You have to bring the microphone so you can hear now. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah. Anyway, I'm Carol McGuire. I represent Merrimack District 29, which is the towns of Allenstown, Epsom, and Pittsfield. And I'm here as the sponsor of House Bill 1648, which eliminates the criminal penalties for home growing and possession of cannabis. It allows one to um, cook with it and make infusions at your home. It does not allow any commercial sales or transfers of cannabis. This is only for personal use. You can give it away, you can't sell it. And you cannot give it to children or minors. And of course, you can't drive under the influence or, or consume cannabis in a public place. Uh, that's the intent of the bill. If you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Are there any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, and if you'll excuse me, my committee's uh, also meeting. I'd like to call Representative Brandy Cushing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Representative Brandy Cushing from Hampton, Rockingham District 21, and I'm here to speak as a co-sponsor and supporter of Representative McGuire's bill. <coughs> For four decades now, we've been wrestling with <coughs> cannabis policy in the state of New Hampshire. And one thing that we've learned since cannabis was outlawed in the early 30s uh, last century is that the campaign uh, against cannabis has been a failure, that the making it illegal has unleashed um, a it has unleashed a whole series of unintended consequences. One of them being that's resulted in a lot of collateral damages, uh, particularly for people who simply use a naturally growing weed in a recreational manner. Um, what this bill will do is kind of put an end to that part. It does not provide for the commercialization of cannabis, but it does allow an individual in the live free or die state to use and possess cannabis and to cultivate it without fear of the power of the state coming down upon them. I think it would have a beneficial impact in that it would free up otherwise uh, <coughs> otherwise being utilized uh, law enforcement assets, for example, to concentrate on trying to deal with criminal activity that has a negative impact upon the health and safety and lives of, of other people. And we've also learned that the criminalization of marijuana has done long-term damage to people's lives. It's brought them in contact with the law enforcement, with the criminal justice system, which in and of itself um, is not a healthy thing for people. I know that you have a number of people behind us that are going to testify. I just wish to lend my support for the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Cushing, I uh, see that uh, the, meth the analysis of the bill uh, indicates that there's a 300 milligram limit, uh, and they are to complaining that it would cost them $300,000 to buy the uh, equipment to do that analysis and uh, maybe another lab uh, uh, member. 
Is, are those concerns uh, realistic? I, I have absolutely no concerns about them. I, I'm not sure that there should be any resources diverted uh, of the state police lab um, in the manner suggested by the, the fiscal note. I think, as you know, last I believe last year, the year before we heard from the director of the police lab, um, who told us that subsequent to the decriminalization of up to three quarters of an ounce of marijuana for simple possession, that the expenditures of the police lab um, on testing for cannabis had dropped precipitously, uh, which resulted in savings for the state of New Hampshire and the ability of that lab to concentrate on um, on other things. So I don't have any concern whatsoever. I, I don't believe that any more money should be spent on that. Thank you. And, and thank you for taking my question. How, it, do you have any opinion on how the law enforcement actually enforce the limitations this bill creates? I'm really referring to the, the six plans inside a household. I mean, how would police ever establish probable cause if there's more than six? I would actually hope that law enforcement would have better things to do than to go around snooping and seeing if somebody has more than six plants growing in their backyard. I don't see it being a law enforcement priority. I think possession of cannabis in and of itself should be decriminalized. I don't think while there's limits put in the bill, um, I just don't see any, I don't know why law enforcement would want to be devoting resources to trying to figure that out. Follow up? Thank you. And they could take my question. So, would you support an amendment then to maybe remove the limitation on the amount of plants inside that a person can have inside their house? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm pretty clear that I'm for repeal of the cannabis laws in this state. This bill is, represents an incremental change. I'm comfortable with the bill the way it, the way it is. If you want to. Um, Suggest that an amendment that would make it even less restrictive, then I might consider supporting that. To me, at the end of the day, it's going to be <coughs> a practical matter of what I what would garner the most support to help end the prohibition of cannabis in the state. So, if it's up to six plants, it's fine. If it's three plants, it's fine. If it's no limit on the number of plants, I'd be fine too. But I, we, to a certain extent, this is a, a game of counting, and I'm Trying to get to <clears throat> trying to get 201 house votes, 13 Senate votes, and a governor's support or a governor's acquiescence to it. Thank you. Is there any other questions? I mean, I, in that manner, I, you know, I do think it's time that New Hampshire end the position that we're in of being this island of prohibition in a sea of you know states that surround us, where adult use of the possession of cannabis is legal. There's absolutely no reason in the world why we should still be carrying on with this arcane public policy. Thank you. I'd like to call Representative Pat Abrami. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, the record state, Pat, uh, Rep. Pat Abrami, uh, Rockingham 19, Strata. Uh, I'm a ways and means guy, but uh, I also chair the Marijuana Commission, so that's why I'm here today. I'm going to speak briefly. Uh, I'm going to give some history. If you recall, a couple of years ago, there was a commercialization bill that came out of this committee that uh, went to the floor and was amended with something very similar to this. And there was a lot of confusion that day. I remember it was a lot of confusion, but it actually passed. And in the error, because it stripped out commercialization, uh, the speaker didn't realize that, that the bill didn't have to go to Ways and Means because it was revenue. There, all the revenue was taken out of it. So it came to Ways and Means anyway. We worked it, uh, and when it came back to the floor, the vote that happened on the floor was turned around totally. It was, it was what passed wasn't passed. Uh, I just want to give you a little of that history. Now, since then, we have the Marijuana Commission, uh, and I'll just put out a, a point out a few things. One conclusion that the commission made, and we had a lot of recommendations in there, uh, was that if we if we legalize, whatever, forget about commercializing, if we legalize 
there should be funds from somewhere to fund addiction prevention and treatment. And you're going to hear people in the back probably say, well, no one gets addicted to marijuana. Well, in my commission, and our commission, we had one day where we opened it up to testimony from the public. And most of the people who showed up were counselor type people. And all telling us stories that, well, I don't know, we wouldn't be in business. We, we see a lot of, most of our patients are patients who are addicted to, to marijuana. So, so be aware of that. And that, uh, again, the commission said, if we're going to legalize, let's make sure there's a flow of money from somewhere. Now, when you commercialize, there's money. Okay, that comes. This, this, there's no, there's no taxing on this. It's all <coughs> uh, The other conclusions that we came to was that this isn't, and I've, I've said this before, many of you heard me say this, this isn't your grandma's or grandpa's marijuana anymore. Uh, this, uh, even the stuff that's going to be bought as seedlings, it's going to be a higher, a higher THC level than in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s. So just keep that in mind as well. And <clears throat> yet the, 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 um, the final thought is the, is the vaping issue. Uh, you know, I, I guess you know, I guess this bill allows for extraction. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't really studied the bill that much. But extracting, that means you can do various things with it, infuse and all of that. Uh, I'm assuming that you can also uh, create um, product that you can vape. And uh, obviously a lot of the vaping problems that we're hearing today are about marijuana-laced uh, products. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're uh, deliberating on this. So those are the main points I want to make, and um, I'm open for questions. Are there any questions? There are no okay. questions. Thank you very thank much for your testimony. I'd like to call Richard Van Winkler. Good morning, Madam Chairman, Honorable Committee. Uh, I do want to apologize in advance for my voice. I do not like the winter air. Um, for the record, my name is Richard Van Wickler, and I represent Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Our website is leap.cc if you'd like to learn a little bit more about us. We appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today on House Bill 1648, which we are in favor of and hope to pass. I've been in New Hampshire law enforcement for the last three decades, and I grew up in the Mount Washington Valley. I've been testifying in favor of cannabis legalization for adult use before these committees of the House and the Senate for the last 12 years. At each testimony, I've provided facts from very reputable sources on this topic and attempted to bring common sense to this debate. I took personal time off from my law enforcement job to testify before this House and Senate, and I'm here before you today as a constituent who cares deeply for my state and the safety and the well-being of its citizens. I would say with respect to the person who just testified before me, that I would hope that money for treatment and rehabilitation is available at any rate, not just if legislation is passed, if we really care. In my previous testimonials, I would list numerous facts about all the benefits of legalization of cannabis for adult use, and I also cited significant harms that remain in our community by not doing so. And each time, I provided a written copy to the committee, so you have them on record here. With great tenacity and emotion after my testimony, oftentimes an on-duty police officer would sit before you in uniform, and they would begin once again with the propaganda of the Nixon administration on why you should not give this debate any time or consideration. Those of us in law enforcement do not make the laws. This House and Senate make the laws. We enforce the laws. 
the majority of citizens in New Hampshire are in favor of legalization of cannabis for adult use. Marijuana is legal in Washington, D.C. and at least nine other states. And it's going to be on the ballot in many more states this year. The gateway theory has been debunked a long time ago. It isn't true. And I hope you don't have to listen to that again today. Some will say that if cannabis is legalized, it will come to my neighborhood. But the fact is, it's in your neighborhood now. But we don't know if it's there in a safe form. Some will say, if we legalize, we won't be able to detect it while somebody is driving. Well, how do we do that now? Or do we believe this doesn't happen now? We've heard many times that it violates federal law. And the federal government would also mandate that we wear seatbelts. And we're the only state in the country that doesn't mandate it in opposition to federal desire. You've heard many times, what message would it send to our children? <coughs> it says to coherent children that we care about them and we don't want them to have access to this substance. It indicates that if we do encounter it, we care that it is regulated and not harmful or life-threatening with tainted ingredients or pesticides. This legislation for many is very emotionally charged. And I am at times appalled how people sit before you and play on those emotions. Having no regulation and no control over distribution is not a public safety policy. I would argue that not having regulation or control actually desires harm on our constituency if we give it just a little thought <coughs> because that's exactly what we have now. Back to the federal law issue. In September, Congress passed 321 to 103 with a healthy bipartisan support, a bill that would permit banks to work with states that have legalized cannabis. The Moore Act was also approved by a congressional subcommittee to end federal marijuana prohibition. Moore stands for Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act. So you see, the federal wall to cannabis prohibition <coughs> is crumbling, and it will fall. Then there's the Schaefer Commission, who was tasked to find reasons in the 1970s by President Nixon for marijuana to be illegal. And they just couldn't find any reason to make that recommendation. And so we have the Controlled Substances Act coming up on 50 years, countering the work of that commission. And then, of course, there's the Tenth Amendment issue. This is our decision to make, not the federal government's. So I ask you, who can make sense out of all of this? You can. Please pass this bill. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. I'd love to call Kate Frey. My name is Kate Fry. I'm um, the Vice President of Advocacy for New Futures. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that works on um, health and wellness policies to improve um, the what health and wellness of the state of New Hampshire. Uh, so I'm really sorry I don't have written testimony for you right now. I will get that to you. Um, I think uh, HB 1648, I think as um, the four corners of the bill, for the most part, is um, illegalizing and allowing um, possession and this cultivation of a small amount. Um, 
we, uh, because it is not a commercialization bill, and we are pleased that it's not a commercialization bill. As you know, we have opposed commercialization in the past. Um, but because I think the sponsors and the proponents of this bill have, have said that's an incremental step, first we pass this and then commercialization. So that does make us cautious and uh, have concerns about the bill and, and, and really oppose the bill for that reason. But there are also a few things in the bill that I was just curious about the intent. Um, and on um, page three, um, line 17 through 19, um, it says no person shall smoke cannabis in public places. Well, we know there are other ways that you can consume cannabis, um, vaping, uh, and we know there are a lot of issues with vaping right now, and um, eating uh, just an edible. So are you saying that it can be used in public, just not smoked? Um, to me, that does not make a lot of sense. First of all, under the Indoor Smoking Act, smoking and vaping is prohibited, but this card's out, so just smoking is. Um, and um, does that mean other types of consumption is legal? So just like under the alcohol, no public consumption, why wouldn't that say that here? Why do we just carve it out to smoking? Um, I think also, too, on that same page, page three, um, it talks about cannabis accessories on page three. You manage, um, it allows for the manufacturing, possessing, or purchasing of cannabis accessories or distributing or selling cannabis accessories to a person who is 21 years age older. So does this allow the creation of cannabis accessories such as vape cartridges and then the, sell of the, the sale of those? So I would just have concerns, especially what we're seeing with the vaping illness, um, that it's allowing the creation of these. I mean, I just don't know why you wouldn't stop at manufacturing, possessing, and purchasing cannabis accessories instead of going that extra step to then allow selling and distributing those. Um, and I think, uh, as the sponsor said, you know, it is um, uh, possession of um, personal possession and cultivation, but it really does allow um, marijuana to be gifted. And a lot of states who just have allowed just legalization and cultivation for personal possession, there is a gifting loophole that has created this industry, really that allows, for example, to buy a t-shirt and get marijuana as well. It's, it's something that's happening um, in Washington, D.C. So if we really just want this for personal use, and it should say that, and not allow the gifting and certainly the um, opportunity to create an industry around gifting. Um, so those are my main concerns. <coughs> and I will submit my written testimony um, later. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Seeing them, I just thank you for your testimony. I'd like to call Honorable Joe Hanna. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, my name is Joe Hanna. Um, and you know, you've heard me, I don't know how many times this last two weeks, sorry. <laughs> but. Um, you know, I'm uh, a member of the policy director for the New Hampshire Harm Reduction Coalition, and I'm also, uh, I was the public member appointed by the governor, not speaking for the governor, but as a public member for the study commission uh, that you heard about earlier for the, uh, to study the regulation and taxation of, uh, of marijuana, as it was called at the time. Um, I, I strongly support this bill, and uh, you know, some of the reasons are very clear. It's, it's long past time to be not the, uh, the island of prohibition surrounded by places that are allowing this. Um, the former president of Mexico once said, Vincente Fox, I don't quote him often, but this was good, uh, prohibition didn't work in the Garden of Eden. Adam ate the apple. Um, and one of, and my, the last quote I'll use is Milton Freeman, an economist, uh, wrote, the one role of prohibition is in making the drug market more lucrative. You know, we hear concerns about commercialization and an increased market. This is a very limited bill that's very similar to homebrew of beer and wine. Uh, currently, if you're not aware, uh, <coughs> brew or uh, manufacture up to 100 gallons of beer or wine for an individual or up to 200 gallons for a household of two or more adults who are legally allowed to do it. There are really no regulations for that whatsoever. We even heard testimony when asked uh, to the Liquor Commission, we were, we were questioning the Liquor Commission during our study, 
And uh, <coughs> you know, we said, well, how do you keep an eye? How do you keep track of these people who are doing homebrew? And they said, well, we don't. You know, it's not a problem. Uh, they're not taking these 200 gallons and mass selling it, creating an industry or a market. It doesn't happen. Uh, and that's a lot of that's much. I, I I wouldn't do a direct comparison, but that's a considerable amount compared to a few plants that someone's allowed to grow for personal home use, even if they're gifting it to a friend. That's not a lot. Um, so if you're if you're worried about a black market forming or commercialization, we have the big marijuana, as, as some people have called it. Uh, industry and it's the illicit market. You have cartels and people who are uh, bringing it in illegally and selling it illegally. We are, there is a basically a worthless commodity that it's can grow in a ditch somewhere and we've made it one of the most, uh, you know, not just cannabis but all drugs are one of the most valuable commodities on earth because it's been made completely illegal. You know, by taking the illegality out of just one small part of that, we can reduce a large percentage of the illicit market. It's going to happen slowly, and I know this has been said to be an incremental step, and that's why some people may be opposed to this legislation. Uh, but you know, let's focus on today. What is happening today? There are people who are risking their, their lives or their livelihood to go out and buy something from someone who may be of a, of a criminal nature. Uh, you know, People that sell uh, cannabis are not necessarily all bad people. Most of them are not. But you have people that are going out, and people that sell cannabis might also be selling cocaine or heroin or fentanyl. I, I, I'm someone, you might have heard before, I'm someone in long-term recovery for over 28 years. And back in my younger days, uh, you know, I did a little bit of this myself, but I never was able to, uh, you know, I never went into a liquor store and was offered uh, cocaine or heroin from the liquor store salesman. It was always the person on the street in the illicit market. You know, if you want to take that gateway, so to speak, because that is really the main way that anything like this could be considered a gateway, is being allowing it to be uh, continue to be sold by people in that arena. So if you want to remove that, make it more readily available to law-abiding to citizens over the age of 21. It's still not allowed for minors or people under the age of 21, even though they probably will vote in your district between 18 and 21. Something to think about. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a couple real brief things. Sorry, um, you know we know that the criminalization is direct, <coughs> disproportionately harms young people and people of color, and uh, massive violence has resulted in the drug war that we've had, and it does nothing to curb youth access. There's no problem as someone who was uh, a young person doing these things uh, at the time had no problem finding illicit substances. And even if you ask, there was someone from one of the youth coalitions who testified in the commission, and uh, they said, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Kids can get it so easily. And that's why we shouldn't make it commercially available. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was some paraphrasing, but it's everywhere. And you don't want to, you want to protect kids by, not, by keeping it illegal. I mean, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's easier for them to get illicit substances than it is to get regulated substances. It's harder, it's, you have to, and it's an extra step. It's still, they're still getting alcohol, they're still getting cigarettes, and they're probably still gonna keep getting cannabis. <coughs> That's gonna happen no matter what you do today. But the, what you're determining today, what you're gonna vote on later, is are they gonna get it from a, a homegrown source, a real, more reliable source, or are they gonna get it from an illicit source who may have given them, act, may give them access to a harder substance that could be more detrimental to them. Uh, that was the gateway for me that led me to harder drug use. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the largest cash crops in this country. You know, it's, it's insane to not allow it, at least for personal usage. Um, you know, our scarce law enforcement resources could be better used to go after, you know, the, we're a safe state, but the few murders we have, rape, rape cases, other violent crimes, sexual assaults. A lot of these cases, uh, because of the war on drugs, have gone down in their, in their clearance rates. Police are just not as able to deal with the workload in some of those areas as they had been back in days prior to the war on drugs. I'd like to be able to get back to where they actually focus on violent crimes and people hurting other people. If someone wants to do something in the, in the privacy of their own home, it shouldn't be anyone's business as long as not hurting someone else. Um, as far as promoting consumer safety, you can't <coughs> complain when you buy something on the illicit market that it was bad. If it was, you know, something that was harmful, most of these vaping uh, cases that we've heard in, in the news recently were all from the illicit market, and you're not going to have that if people are able to get a safer product in another way. Um, 
We know that healthy adults, it's relatively benign if there are problems with usage over time. They're easily reversible in adults. And I'm not saying it's safe for children. Obviously, we don't, I, I'm in no way saying that children should be doing this. And it's, there is a problem with developing brains. And it should be, uh, you know, educate, people should be educated and convinced not to do that. But this is not the way to do it. You know, if we make something more inaccessible, kids want to do it. You know, if you tell an adult that's bad for you, most adults go, oh, I hear that's bad for you. You tell a kid that's bad for you, they go, oh, I wonder what that's like. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to do that anymore. We have to change the way we're thinking. We voted, you voted for this so many times in the past. The legislature has passed it. Um, and this is the most uh, sensible way of doing, doing that. It's removed a lot of the fears for past opponents. And, um, Basically, there's, there's so many other things I could say, and you've heard them so many times, you probably have more, so I'll, I'll stop and answer questions if you have any. Are there any questions? Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking my question. I appreciate your testimony. It's always informed. Oh. I appreciate that. But if, on page three, lines seven through nine, it puts a restriction on someone cultivating. Basically, they cannot put the plant in their window if it's visible to their neighbor. Now, my, my issue with that provision is that if you're going to legalize home cultivation, you're basically restricting someone from using natural light to grow the plant. So is there, what is the rationale for having that provision? What's your opinion? I don't, I don't want to speak to the, the motivation for putting that in there. I'm not really sure. But uh, you know, I think it's, it, uh, my speculation is it might go to just comfort in passing a bill saying, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see smoking in public. I don't want to see people smoking in public myself. That's a, that's a personal issue. But if someone's doing it in their own home, if they want to put a potted plant in the window, I don't care if it's a cannabis plant or a poinsettia. Uh, it really has no effect on my life, what they're doing in their, their private window. Um, does it make people feel more comfortable? I think that's probably the main motivation for it. I, I don't think, um, you know, if, if someone is growing a lot, we're talking a few plants. so. You're not going to be looking out your window ever seeing a crop. It's not going to be like people making, getting tractors and cutting corn, you know, uh, crop circles with uh, cannabis plants in the nature. We're talking three plants. They cut a crop circle. It's kind of done. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's a problem to leave it in or take it out. Uh, you're still going to get light because you can put up a fence. And I think we discussed that in the commission talking about, you know, privacy. You don't want to, people might not want to see it. But if you put a fence up, light can still come up from the top. My, I always remember the sun coming up a little higher than my tree line most of the year. But uh, not, not worry about it. Thank you. Follow up? Just to follow up. Just to clarify, I would support removing that provision in its entirety. Sure. I'm not against that. Just there's one other, if you look on that same page. Follow up? Yeah, yes. Follow up? On that same page, there's, fine, there's a fine for public use, and then there's a fine for, the fine for public use is $100. The fine for not following the cultivation restrictions mm -hmm. is $750. Do you feel that those, Fines are disproportionate. Maybe one should be lower. Maybe one should be higher. Or give me opinion on that. I, I personally think they should mirror the laws for home brewing wine and beer, which there are none. So that's that's my personal opinion on that. Okay. There are they are they are excessive. I believe seven hundred fifty dollar fine is a, is a bit steep. You know, going through a stop sign has a lower penalty, and that's more dangerous in my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Chester. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, a couple of times you uh, alluded to what a person does in their own home, and, and I certainly agree with you. We need to keep the, the, uh, the police out of our own home. The question is, uh, a person who has used or is using uh, pot uh, while driving or at work, like a, let's say Home Depot or Lowe's, how do you determine that they've had too much? Are there any tools for that? Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, how does a, a owner of a, a business uh, deal with this? Because if, once we make it legal, he's going to ask, I tested the person, and he tested positive. So, so do you have, a, you have a mechanism for testing this? Do you know of any mechanisms for testing whether a person is impaired? There's, there's several parts to that question. One was, well, I'll start with the last one first, the workforce. Uh, I don't believe there's anything in this bill that prohibits. Uh, and there's another bill that, that pertains to testing, I believe, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, there's, what a business person does in their own business is a separate issue, I believe. 
Uh, because alcohol is legal, that doesn't mean someone can show up to their, their place of employment uh, drunk. Um, I imagine it would be the same with this. As far as uh, driving under the influence or operating a vehicle, it's already illegal. Uh, and people say, well, more, the only argument, the only time that argument of, well, it'll, people will drive is if you're expecting an, an inordinate number of more people to be using cannabis. Now, will more people be using cannabis? There may be in the beginning, because after Prohibition ended, more people drank for a brief period of time relative to the Prohibition years. But those numbers, you know, they did stabilize over time, and it's still illegal. In the beginning of uh, pro alcohol prohibition being lifted, there were no really good breathalyzer tests. There was a very primitive one back in those days, or right around, around that time. But it took many years to get a good breathalyzer test. There is a race, and the first person to, first company to figure out how to make a really good one. And there's at least two or three companies out there that have technology available that are being uh, tested in pilots around the country. I can't remember the exact study of where they're doing it, but there are some ongoing um, uh, tests. And they, they can detect it. The question is, how much is uh, an impaired amount? And with alcohol, it's a very linear relationship. If you weigh this much and you drink this much, you're probably this impaired. It's almost a linear progression. With cannabis, it, is, it does vary by individual, so it's hard to say. Someone may be able to consume a much larger dose of uh, THC component and, and not be as impaired. Uh, they've done studies on impaired driving, and they've done insurance studies that have shown that accidents rates have gone up in certain areas that had legalized or medicalized it. Uh, but most of those accidents were fender benders and low-speed collisions. I mean, if someone's doing, you know, 15 miles an hour on, on 101 or 93, the police are pretty sure that person isn't drunk on alcohol. They can kind of guess that the person is probably on a cannabis product, and they're less likely to cause, uh, you know, a fatality in some studies. There was only one state, I think, that had increased fatalities out of four or five, I think about five, I can't remember the exact number, I'm sorry, but uh, there were several states that actually had no effect or went down. Um, you know, so the company that figures out, whoever figures that out, that as a reliable test, they're going to be super rich. They're going to be billionaires, and everyone will be using it. But currently, we do have drug uh, drug uh, detection officers that are trained. We have, I forget how many now we have. A few years ago, it was in the, I think the low 200 range in New Hampshire, but uh, drug detection officers. But they are, um, you know, every officer can pull someone over for, you know, reckless driving and, and what they suspect to be impaired driving. If they can get one of those officers to come, they are trained to recognize certain aspects about people's eyes, their pupils, their behavior, uh, the tests that they, roadside tests they can give them, and they can prosecute. Mind you, the vast majority of, uh, that, of substances that people consume in this country are prescription drugs. You know, there is an illicit market. You do have people doing things like fentanyl and, and cannabis and, and even drinking, but most people that are, that are impaired are probably impaired by pills or medications that are prescribed. Opiates, we have billions of opiates prescribed a year in this country, billions of pills, sleeping pills, anxiety medications, <coughs> cough syrups, uh, other medications to, be, to treat a, a wide variety <coughs> of conditions that, that may impair driving. They are all considered uh, to be substance, if you are under the influence of any of those things, whether it's legal or not, you are an impaired driver. And the test is no better for finding someone who took a, an anxiolytic medication or a benzodiaz benzodiazepine, like a Valium or something, than, say, cannabis. So, uh, you know, we're talking, a, you know, there are people that will be probably doing it, but I don't see that number increasing over the current usage. We have, uh, I forget the exact number, uh, but a few years ago when we were studying it, they, uh, they estimated in the hundreds of, over $100 million of cannabis is being consumed in New Hampshire every year. And that was in the, in the unregulated market. So to, to think that a few homegrown plants are going to drastically change that, I, I, I don't see that happening. Uh, but I'm, I, no one is for driving under the influence, and I don't see this. This will actually have a deterrent effect. Consider someone who is a heavy user of cannabis products having to drive to one of our neighboring states to get it over an hour, two or three hours away, and then drive back. You know, that's more dangerous in my mind, to have someone on the road. I'd rather be <coughs> home using it or home, home growing it. That's less likely to be on the road. Uh, I believe uh, in Vermont, one of the main concerns was road fatalities. And not that it was a direct causation, but when they, uh, you know, when they changed their laws, their fatalities went down. I believe, and I, there's some experts who can talk better than I, but I think it was almost 30% 30, 30 less road fatalities. Thank you. Representative Bean? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about your reaction to the argument that we shouldn't pass a bill like this because the strength of marijuana or cannabis has increased significantly uh, since
since the 1970s, does the strength of, of the plant make a difference in your mind? I mean, if you, if you look at, if you have, anytime you have something that's called <coughs> conservation or strength, you have a, a different effect, but our state liquor stores sell grain alcohol in proofs well over 150, 190 proof. Uh, you know, why do they not sell that? Because they expect someone to get more drunk? Obviously, people that are buying grain alcohol are probably getting a little more inebriated, but they don't have to drink the whole bottle. You know, if you have a stronger concentration or something, you don't have to use the whole thing. You can just have a smaller amount. Someone may not be able to smoke as much. And we also have seen in legalization states, people actually smoke less and use edibles more because, one, it's easier. Um, and they don't have to actually smoke and inhale uh, what may be a noxious feeling uh, thing to them. Um, you know, I was an asthmatic as a child, and my pulmonary doc was telling me I was a teenager, and he's like, you know, 100 years ago, we used to prescribe, not we, but they used to prescribe cannabis for asthma, and people felt better, but they, this, the actual inhaling smoke might not have been good for them, so it's better to have edibles and increased use of non-smoking products. Um, if, but like the strength, you don't have to smoke the whole thing. You don't have to eat the whole candy bar. Um, you know, I get Campbell's soup by the can, and my wife says, don't forget to dilute it with another can. You know, I don't just drink the whole can, the whole can without diluting it sometimes. So it's, it's just like alcohol. Follow up? Yeah, just, just a quick follow up so, <laughs> so I understand. Um, so if, if you're growing, uh, if, if you're growing plants at home, it seems like there are a fair number of people these days who, for just the reasons you specified, um, might be using the plant uh, to make edibles versus, uh, you know, versus, versus to, to, to smoke it. Um, in your mind, are there any differences in the usage patterns between people who favor edibles over smoking? I can't speak to personal experience recently. It's been quite a long time. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I can say that, uh, you know, it's, you know, if you give somebody a, you know, one of the largest increases, of the largest demographic of people who increased in medical uh, card holders were elderly. You know, uh, there were people that once it became uh, you know, medicalized or therapeutic, they would start using it, because otherwise they wouldn't have probably used it. They would have probably drank and taken their opiates like the doctors were prescribing. But, um, you know, we know that uh, edibles are uh, probably a, a better way of taking it, so that you might have any, you know, mild risks of lung problems. It's not as damaging as uh, nicotine and uh, uh, other tobacco products as far as lung cancer. There's no studies that show it's, it's even nearly, uh, it's not even the same ballpark as that. But um, the only problem, and I will say this, is, this was a problem originally in Colorado, um, they had an increase in uh, people going to the ERs. And they said it was, you know, I forget the numbers, like a thousand percent increase, but we're talking maybe like 44 to like, you know, a few hundred in a state with millions and millions of people. So a very insignificant number. But once something becomes legalized, you're more likely to go to the ER when something happens. If something's illegal, I'm like, oh, I don't know, I shouldn't go there and get, you know, why would you come forward with something that's against the law? But um, the vast majority of people, not the vast, but many of the people they were seeing were, that were having problems were people who were eating edibles from out of state who were doing cannabis tourism in a sense. They came and they didn't understand that you have to wait an hour or longer. So they would eat the, the candy bar or the cookie or whatever, and then half hour later, they just didn't do anything. Then they'd have another one. You know, you don't have that with smoking. And that is a problem, but that's easily solved by educating people. They could have a little sign in the store or someone just say, hey, you know, hey, wait before you have another brownie. But, um, you know, with smoking, there is a much more immediate effect. Yeah. Follow up? One, one final question slash observation. Um, would you be surprised to hear that um, my son and a lot of his friends consider this to be uh, their only hope for dealing with uh, my generation? <laughs> <laughs> you said it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't be at all surprised, um, you know, but that is also the generation that brought us the Tide Pod phenomenon. I asked the, the head of the, uh, the, uh, the, basically the former the cannabis czar in Colorado after he stepped down, he was talking to our commission by t uh, remote access, and uh, um, I'm sorry, the medical director. And I said, uh, you know, there were 10,000 exposures reported to poison control centers in the previous year for consumption of, uh, you know, between the ages of, you know, X and, I forget what it was, like three or five and eight years of age. 
for this you know product and um, you know they all were basically okay but they had to go to the hospital they went to poison control centers um, and it was for type it was for laundry detergent pot exposures I said how many people out of those few hundred people that went to the ER for uh, eating a cannabis product that were underage how, what's a bigger problem was the Tide Pod, was the Tide Pod, the laundry detergent a bigger problem, or ex getting into cannabis? I have a young daughter who, and my wife's an emergency physician, so she has poison control and speed dial. She calls up, they say, hi, doctor, you know, they know her by name, by voice. Uh, my daughter got into the cabinet when she was a toddler and grabbed a laundry soap, a dish soap, and drank it, and it was, she was okay, but my wife did the right thing. She called poison control, and kids get into stuff. So they actually made more uh, stricter packaging rules and things in their state for the commercial sale. But in a home, you know, they can get into anything. You know, you can, the kid can, my, my son brought me a handful of those little plastic plugs you put into the sockets one day when he was two years old. He just had a screwdriver in one hand and a bunch of those in the other because I found these. You know, there's, you're not gonna stop everything from happening, but I think, you know, having people educated on safety and people, if something does like happen like that, a parent will be, if something's legal and they're not gonna get arrested for having those few plants at home, if by chance a young person or a child gets into anything, that parent has no reason not to come forward and report that to poison control or get a doctor to see them and make sure that they're, well, they're, they're gonna be okay, but to, to get reassurance and actually get some care. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Seeing okay, none, I thank you for your testimony. You I'd like to call Paul Chidney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, since I was here this morning, I thought I'd get a two for and testify to two bills. Um, I was, uh, I'm Paul Toomey, I'm from Chichester, New Hampshire, I'm an attorney. I was a member of the commission also that the chairman of Robbie um, chaired, um, and Dr. Hinton was on. Um, I'd like to, be, I had some sort of general remarks, but I'd like to address <coughs> some of the things that were brought up a little bit earlier because one of my roles on the committee was the chair asked myself and another member of the committee to review as much of the sort of scientific and medical and law enforcement studies that had been done about cannabis and then uh, we both of us selected uh, pro and con the best studies and tried to agree as much as we could. And I urge all of you, if you have questions, to go back and look at that commission report because there's just a ton of information in it. And things have been learned since then. But, um, it's, it's pretty up to date. Um, in regards to, so let me just a couple of things that have come up. And one, one is the high THC that um, Representative Abrami brought up. It, it is true that um, you see marijuana, cannabis plants with higher levels of THC now than you saw in the 60s, but that is a function of illegality. Not, that didn't happen when it was legal. That happened when it was illegal. And the same thing happened with alcohol during Prohibition. Um, you, nobody was selling beer during Prohibition. They were selling whiskey. And the reason is it's easier to, if you have a higher concentration of whatever the substance is, um, you can move smaller amounts and you're less likely to get arrested. Um, um, if, if, if the offense is by weight of the um, plant or material you're moving, if, it, if you get more bang to the buck, then you are less exposed to prison type sentences. So the increase in THC is completely a function of the fact that if people selling it illegally um, want it to be concentrated. Um, basically, in terms of use of the THC, people themselves who are adults, and that's all we're talking about here as adults, can determine how much or how little they want. You can buy beer on the low end uh, of um, toxicity if you want, um, and drink it, drink 40 of I them, and you'll be as drunk as anybody who drinks 150 grain. And the same is true with marijuana or any other substance. So the, the level within the um, plant itself is really somewhat <coughs> beside the point. It doesn't have any, it's not going to be any better if you leave it completely illegal. And you're not addressing anything in that regard. Um, in, someone asked a question about um, the number of plants. Um, I think it was Representative Abbas. Um, it's at six in this bill. Um, I personally don't care about the number of the plants, but the, the um, experience in, I think, Colorado and some of the other states, they set a very high level at first. I think it was 99 plants a person would have, and they were seeing diversion. After a year or two, they dropped it down to, I believe it is six, six or five, something like this. And they saw just the elimination of the 
large amounts of diversion. Um, so that's why that was put in the bill originally, I think, is to um, eliminate that problem. And Colorado hasn't had any problem with it since they dropped it down. Um, there are no indications that um, legalization of use leads to more minoring, more use by to children. In fact, in Colorado and Washington, they both have seen, and they've had the longest experience with legalization, they've both seen slight declines in use by children, and that's by studies from the federal government. Um, the, um, we heard some testimony from Representative Brahmi about the counselors who came in, and I thought the telling part of that is what he said first. He said, they would, we wouldn't be in business if you legalize it. Well, that's what it is. It's a business. You know, like anytime anybody comes in to you and testifies, you want to know what, what their own personal interests are. And we heard from a lot of people who are in the marijuana treatment business. And, you know, it's not surprising that they don't want to have to go out and learn how to be a mechanic or something else. Um, what's interesting and what we saw in the commission is that marijuana is a little bit different from other drugs in terms of the who goes to treatment. With other drugs like alcohol and, and, and heroin and things like that, you see um, people want treatment because their lives are just in disarray. Marijuana is the only substance, I believe it has something like 64, 65% of the people who go to treatment are ordered to go to treatment because it's illegal. Not because it's affecting their life in some way, but because it's illegal and a court tells them they have to get treatment. In other words, it's a mandatory treatment. It's not something where somebody's seeing an effect on their own life. Um, I was a um, criminal, as I mentioned this morning, a criminal defense lawyer for 35 years, and a large number of the people you represent um, have substance abuse problems of some kind. Of <coughs> so that's, that's one truism, of, uh, probably about 80% of them have substance abuse problems, and about 99% of them want to blame their situation on something, you know, because it's just part of human nature. In, in 35 years, I had literally thousands of people tell me that alcohol led them to a prison cell or a jail cell. I never had a single human being ever, to, and I had, I've had people say, LSD, I took LSD and I did this, I wouldn't normally have done it. I didn't have a single person ever say that their marijuana use caused them to commit crimes. I used to ask police officers, um, you ever get in a fight with somebody who pulled over who was high on marijuana? And they'd just laugh. People who are high on marijuana want to avoid conflict. And people on alcohol want to get in there and mix it up. Um, you do not see, in, in any of the states, you, you don't see any increase in crime rates. You see Washington State has a, this is in the commission report, um, had preliminary findings that not only don't you see an increase in the crime, but you see an increase in the clearance rates of other crimes, of more serious crimes. And that's because police officers aren't wasting their time on something that isn't hurting anybody and isn't causing a danger to the public. If somebody is causing a danger to the public, if, if they're impaired and driving, well, that's still going to be against them. This isn't going to change anything like that. Um, ultimately, and I'll wrap it up with this, um, I think that an adult should be able to make this decision by themselves. I, really, I, don't, think the federal, they, I don't feel that I need the federal government's help in deciding what substances to ingest in my body. I think I can do the research and I can make that decision. I don't drink, I don't smoke cigarettes, and I don't smoke marijuana. I make all three of those decisions myself, and I, you know, with all due respect to you people, I, I don't need your help either. I, mean, I can make those decisions. I think every adult can make those decisions for themselves, what they do in their home, to their own body. I think that should be part of being an adult in this country. If they need help, we should do everything we can to get help, but ultimately I think people should be able to make those kind of decisions for themselves. Thank you, Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Is there a Mr. Orsowitz here? I have a card here from a gentleman from Keene. Nobody? My name is Nobody, and I'm a candidate for governor. Um, and uh, but I also happen to be a uh, minister in a cannabis church, 
And one of the problems with the bill, and I do support the bill, but one of the issues is that the, uh, the religious freedom to use cannabis has never been addressed in New Hampshire. And I think it's very important that that should be addressed because there are Rastas, there are people from my church, the Church of the Invisible Hand, there are people from many spiritual faith who believe that cannabis is a, uh, is a, uh, good God, I can't think of the word. Sacrament. Sacrament, thank you, sacrament. Um, <laughs> we think of cannabis as a sacrament. And our religious liberty has been trampled on for a hundred years in the name of the war on drugs, okay? Nobody should go to prison for practicing his religion. Nobody should be fined for practicing his religion. No church should be limited in the amount of sacramental cannabis they can keep around, or whether they limit that cannabis to donors. And this is a, this is a very important um, issue that's been neglected. Now, of course, the Supreme Court has heard this argument and rejected it, but the basis on which they rejected it was it hasn't aged well. Because their argument was if people were smoking marijuana, as if people weren't smoking marijuana, if people were smoking marijuana, that would be such a breach of the public order that there would be dogs and cats living together, hell and brimfire falling from the sky. It would be a disaster. Well, people smoked weed then, and people smoke weed now, and there is no disaster. The only disaster is the war of genocide that you people have been waging against us for a hundred years. That has been a disaster, you know? I think you should learn some of the things that kids learn, stoner kids learn, when they find out that the government is at war with them. That the government will so, so stop just it you. This, this bill is about personal um, use of marijuana, and it is, doesn't have anything really to do with religious use. And so, if you would just speak to this bill, we would appreciate it. Okay. Very much. Well, the uh, I will I will speak then on the issue that somehow it's going to be better for a kid to have a criminal record, to go to jail, whatever, um, rather than having a little bit of weed. And I would suggest that you change the minor in possession section of the statute to calling their parents. Because having a little bit of weed, that's a calling the parents level offense. It's not a let's, let's take legal action against this kid offense. The idea that kids should be subject to more criminal li uh, criminal liability than adults kind of flies in the face of, uh, of reason when you think about it. I mean, we're going to attach a criminal penalty to your behavior because your mind is not well enough formed yet to make decisions that have a lasting impact. Well, don't you think it's possible that taking criminal sanction against somebody has a lasting impact on their life? And maybe they shouldn't be bound to that by a decision they made so young. Um, and with that, I'll that'll yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to call Ross Connolly. You have to put it close to you now. There we go. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. My, uh, for the record, my name is Ross Connolly. I'm the Deputy State Director for Americans for Prosperity here in New Hampshire. I'll be as brief as possible since I don't want to be repetitive and respectful of your time. Uh, I'm here to voice our support for HB 1648. Uh, and I'll start off by saying we don't support legalization because we think that cannabis is good and that people should be using it and there's no problems associated with it. What we look at it as we've had 50, uh, over 50 years now 
of experimenting with uh, the prohibition of cannabis. And the results we've seen are very clear. The collateral consequences associated with pro prohibition have touched every community in New Hampshire. Uh, and it, it's well past time that we started to change the way that our state regards cannabis policy and cannabis users. Uh, there's thousands and, th and thousands of people in the Granite State that use cannabis, as, as, as we've heard from pre previous speakers, uh, that use cannabis on a regular basis. And uh, we need to look at it as, as a issue of should we be punishing these people for this act? And uh, we at AFP believe that because of the consequences of having that criminal record, we should absolutely look at other avenues uh, to address this issue. And uh, just from a little historical perspective on this bill, um, so last year we supported a bill <coughs> called HB 481, which would have set up a commercialized, uh, regulated market. This bill does not do that. And, and one of the reasons behind that is during the legislative process last year, we listened to the feedback of opponents to that bill. And we wanted to make a compromise so that uh, we can all agree to please take these, these penalties off the books so we halt the practice of arresting and punishing Granite Staters for uh, possession of cannabis. And that's simply what this bill does. It, it corrects that 50-year uh, that mistake that we've had. Um, just some other notes. Uh, so doing, doing this uh, this way, with this compromise, it allows the police to more readily focus resources on combating serious problems in New Hampshire. Last, uh, yesterday I testified on a bill uh, in support of uh, diverting more monies towards treatment for the opioid and opiate epidemic. That's where our law, law enforcement's focus should be. Not on uh, policing, fining, and arresting people for possession of cannabis. And if you look behind me and if you heard speakers uh, <coughs> over the past hour or so, uh, there is a broad, broad coalition of, of Granite Staters that support this bill. There are people from every political, social, and e economic background that recognize that this is a wrong and that we should correct it. And I encourage you uh, very much so. I encourage you to pass this, this bill and to give relief to those people living in the shadows of prohibition and bring them out into the light of day. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? There are none. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. I'd like to call Heather Brown. Apologies, children. <laughs> so, hello. Um, my name is Heather Marie Brown, and I am a resident of Barnstead, New Hampshire, born and raised right here <coughs> in what is supposed to be the live for your die state. Um, currently, I am a therapeutic cannabis patient, so I am, at this moment, allowed legal access to cannabis. Um, the only reason being, because I have that cute little fancy card that allows me to use therapeutic cannabis. Um, I do not and have not ever felt that we should have to have a card in order to access something that was given to us naturally throughout years of evolution. Um, I don't need a special card to allow me to eat corn that I grew in my backyard. I don't need a special little license to, you know, do a lot of things here in the state. Um, I feel that this bill needs to pass. It is time. New Hampshire 
potentially that right now, counting New Hampshire, there are potentially 40 states by the end of 2020 that will either already have recreational cannabis available to them or are in the process of acquiring <coughs> those new laws and regulations. Um, we've also seen, as you've heard, there is a huge shift at the federal level. Uh, myself and a gentleman back here by the name of Daniel Stockwell, uh, both of us will be traveling out to Washington, D.C. in March and actually have an opportunity to go and speak with our members out there in relation to this very issue. Um, this is a huge drain on the system. There are so many other priorities in New Hampshire that need to be addressed and taken care of that this should not be one of them. We are constantly worried about harm and indications that could come if cannabis is legalized. We're worried about the black market. Well, I'm sorry. The black market's here. It has been here. If you want that to disappear, then you need to stop the prohibition against this plant. Because the more you keep it restricted from people, the more the people are going to want to obtain it. And that's where you run the risk of the dangers associated with it. Um, you know, it, it was funny, I loved your comment you made, uh, but as far as the edibles versus smoking, uh, I myself actually prefer to eat edibles um, and I find myself using edibles less than I would have inhaled flour. So I don't know if that gives you any indication, but there is a difference. It's a personal preference of mine. Um, I also know that when I go to make these products, I'm not putting myself in any jeopardy. In fact, some of you have probably already done some sort of extraction or combination cooking in your own homes and that's pretty much the equivalent of how I make myself a batch of cookies or a batch of brownies. So there's really no danger associated with that either in my opinion. Um, I think that there is a stigma around this topic and I think that there's a stigma associated with how individuals that use cannabis are. And I, for one, would like to tell you that we're not all a bunch of Cheech and Chongs. We're not all a bunch of people just <coughs> with low IQs and low intelligence and you know low motivation sitting around doing nothing but eating chips and playing video games. Many of us are very active in our communities. We're parents, we're professionals, we're business owners. We are actually quite successful. Some individuals may even roam the halls in these very buildings. <coughs> so I, I think that that stigma needs to go away. Um, you know, it's just, it's a shame that we are, again, just as it's stated, an island of prohibition. Our motto as a little girl, oh, I loved it, I always told everybody, live free or die, live free or die. And now I'm like, I get sad when I hear that because that's not how we're living here in New Hampshire. Um, I just really hope that all of you will be able to stand behind and support this. Um, I think that law enforcement is taxed enough I think that your constituents have spoken enough in regards to this matter, and I think that there needs to be time for change. And a human being should have the right to be at home and do with themselves and consume what they choose to consume in relevance to cannabis the same way they can tobacco or alcohol. So I will not take up a lot of your time because I do know that there are a kajillion people that want to speak today, but I do thank you. And um, I also, just to let you know so that 
again with the stigma <coughs> issue. I also happen to very proudly be a um, patient representative <coughs> member for the New Hampshire Therapeutic Cannabis Medical Oversight Board. Um, that is a position that I hold dear and I'm very grateful to have. Uh, so again, you know, obviously if I was an individual sitting around eating chips and playing video games, then I probably would not have been able to be appointed to that position. So I hope you take this into consideration and I hope that you will pass this with nothing but 100% approval. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to call Dan Stockwell's one minute you have written down here. Start the plan, yeah. um, hello, um, my name is Dan Stockwell and I'm from Dublin, New Hampshire. Um, and I'm holding myself to a minute because I do want to keep it brief. Um, but I've been um, self-medicated breeding my own cannabis for over 30 years. And uh, I've been a public servant working in public schools, um, tracking chins, kids with the court system, counseling autistic children and their parents. Um, I have asked diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome myself. And, uh, <coughs> and growing up with the live free or die motto, um, I think it's more relevant today than ever. Um, for me, that's always been a dark thing because I never felt myself as living free in the state and the option well, I was suicidal my whole life, and that's what that motto represented to me. And just uh, in the last couple of years, I think one, one year we had 122 uh, gun deaths in this state, 96% of them were suicides. Um, but <coughs> those rates actually go down when you look at states that have legalized, mentioning that. If we want us to be um, on course with states around us, the natural progression has been in Vermont, <coughs> Massachusetts, and Maine to legalize the home grow first and then proceed with how that goes looking at the commercial. And all those places have gone on to commercial, so obviously the home grow um, uh, went okay. And, and uh, I, I also feel a lot of the people in the state um, like Heather mentioned, we go to D.C. Uh, with an organization called Americans for Safe Access, and <clears throat> they're the largest organization um, uh, promoting uh, therapeutic use of safe access to keep for therapeutic use and research. Um, but when I go and meet down there with the patients and researchers, and I tell them that patients don't even have the right to grow, and we have a medical marijuana program that's very shocking to them, and um, and their reaction is they're treating you like a bunch of children, um, and and I believe that there's a lot of people in the state right now that don't have respect for their state government because of how this issue is being dictated, and I think you win back a lot of good faith from the population. Um, because people don't want to be told what to do in the privacy of their home. Alaska's allowed this since the 70s on the basis of keeping it private in your own home. And in Washington, D.C., they, they, they allow this in the privacy of their own home. And it's, it's shameful and humiliating that we don't have the same rights as people in our state capital. And uh, if you have any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Let's call Tracy Kelman. Hi, uh, my name is Tracy Bowman Kelman. I am from Harrisville, New Hampshire, and um, this is the first time I've been involved in any of these proceedings since they've been going on, and um, I find that somewhat embarrassing. Um, I am a certified nurse midwife and nurse practitioner. I've been practicing in New Hampshire since 1988. And um, this past year, I have been studying cannabis medicine and 
am developing uh, my practice to be able to help people more with that. And the biggest thing that I'm encountering every time I talk to my patients about it is that um, it's very expensive and um, also they don't trust the products that they're able to get. So being able to grow your own medicine is extremely important to people. And um, also of note is the largest population of people in the United States beginning to use cannabis that maybe never have are people over the age of 50. And I do think most people over the age of 50 are fairly responsible adults um, and can manage the, um, the growing of it and keeping it safely in their house if, if they have children still in the house. Um, and knowing whether they're incapacitated or not, whether they should be driving. Um, so I urge you to support this bill and uh, I think that's all I need to say. Thank you very much for your testimony. I'd like to call excuse me, Lisa Powers. Hello, can you hear me? My name is Lisa Powers. I'm from Dallastown, New Hampshire. I'm a registered nurse. I'm a cannabis patient and a cannabis caregiver. I'm going to present this poster. Uh -huh. This is uh, the Reefer Madness, you know, from the 1930s, and this is where Prohibition really started. Pictures, anyone? Um, the reason why I have this is because I uh, put it on easels. I have a few of them, actually, and I, I do panel discussions and try to educate the public on the safe use as a nurse. That's what we want to do. We want people to be safe. Um, my journey started when my son actually needed it for a severe case of epilepsy. He is an adult. I hadn't used cannabis for 30 years because I didn't want to. I did it back in the 70s like everybody else did practically. But I had to dive back into it because I heard about CBD. You know, it's from cannabis as well. They call it hemp, but whatever. And when I did that research, I discovered that the whole prohibition history, I never knew about that. During that research, I found myself getting angry and tearful and very distrusting of my government. And I'm a law-abiding citizen, at least I'd like to say that I am, but I have broken a couple of laws since I had to get medicine for my son. We went through the proper channels, we got our uh, card, and I was so excited to get him some CBD for his epilepsy, the dispensaries didn't have any. They said we didn't know when we could get any, and I was devastated. So I did go to Massachusetts. I went through it as a mother would. I wanted to help my son. But during that research and discovering why it's prohibited, just blew me away. It was just propaganda. It was just stories. This, cannabis doesn't do this. It's not about reefer madness. It's kind of a funny thing, but um, to me, laws are developed to protect. What crime are people committing by using this plant? I don't know. What, what are they doing to harm? I don't know. I can't think of anything. So I think it's a little ridiculous. There, if we want to allow adults here in New Hampshire to use this substance at home, we should. I mean, it's ridiculous that we want to stop them. And like uh, the lady before me spoke, the demographic who's using cannabis the most right now is over 50. I mean, it's exploding. Because they're finding that it's a relaxant, it helps them sleep, they don't drink alcohol hardly ever when they start using cannabis, which cannabis is a liver protectant. So, hey, more, more people should be going that route, I think. Uh, I've watched people die as a nurse, bedside, from nicotine addiction and alcohol addiction. They couldn't stop. But no one ever died because they used cannabis every day. Do we have people that use it too much? Yeah, especially the young people. They do it now when it's not legal. They're probably gonna do it when it is, you know, they were doing it when it's illegal, they're gonna continue to do it. Just like we have people that drink too much and kids that get into the parents' liquor cabinet. That's not gonna go away. But as a nurse, I think we should be educating <coughs> the public. We should have like billboards and sessions at the library. We need to educate people, especially with the edibles. 
You can have some not fun experiences with that. <laughs> um, I have had that experience myself. So I know how to educate people in that for sure. Um, but I think we need to be sensible here in this state. We're, we're adults. And it will affect the black market. And I want it to. That's all I have to say. I guess you can tell them four. <laughs> yes, thank Sorry. you. Sorry. <laughs> thank you for your testimony. <laughs> To call Jean Ruska. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Jeannie Ruska. I'm the political director for the ACLU of New Hampshire. Maybe you could speak into the microphone. And I'm here to testify in support of HB 1648. The ACLU strongly supports cannabis legalization as part of comprehensive criminal justice reform. We have been so encouraged by this legislature's bipartisan support for criminal justice reform in recent years, including debtor's prison, bail reform, and cannabis decriminalization. Decriminalization was an encouraging first step, um, but it was a very, very small step. Cannabis prohibition has devastated communities. It's been part of the war on drugs that has contributed to mass incarceration. It has left people with felony records that plagued them for decades with hefty collateral consequences in terms of employment, housing, access to loans, and access to education. More importantly, cannabis prohibition has been disproportionately enforced against communities of color. We see racial disparities in arrest rates almost across the board, and New Hampshire is not immune to these. Attached to my testimony um, is a one-pager from a report the ACLU did a number of years ago um, about the racial disparities in marijuana enforcement. Uh, these numbers um, predate decrim, but I'll note that we have no reason to believe that these racial disparity numbers are any different post decrim. As we all know, decrim applies to a very small amount of cannabis, meaning there is still cannabis enforcement going on in this state. People are still being arrested for it, and we assume that these racial disparities are still applicable. So as part of racial justice, as part of comprehensive criminal justice reform, and quite frankly, as part of ending mass incarceration, New Hampshire has to achieve cannabis legalization, and we think HB 1648 is a great way to take that step forward. I'm happy to answer questions. Are there any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. I'd like to call Joseph Abras. Abras? Joseph A. Brooks. Brooks? That wasn't a good pen you wrote with. No, no, it wasn't, but it was what was provided, so I did my best. Okay, sorry to mispronounce it. Bear with me for a moment. I want to make sure I get a good recording on this one, too. How's it going, everybody? My name's Joseph Allen Brooks. And I was born in Manchester, New Hampshire at Elliott Hospital on March 3rd, 1983 to Wanda Jean Harding and Richard Sherman Brooks, a New Hampshire medical cannabis patient. And I think HB 1648 should pass. New Hampshire's motto is and always has been live free or die. I remember growing up, my mother telling me courageous stories of presidents and other great people in our government and why the people fled England. Our forefathers came to America to look for gold, slaves, and land. Our forefathers who drafted our Constitution and our Bill of Rights were also known to have grown, used, or sold cannabis and conceived some textile uses for hemp. Cannabis prohibition began in an era of ignorance, was lied about and demonized. Abuse of power, discrimination, assault, even murder have been tools of the officials enforcing control over a plant. Not to protect children, but to close out a potential game changer in the textile and cotton industry at the order of the President Richard Nixon, the war on drugs, cannabis, was created. It is believed by many that Nixon scapegoated marijuana, cannabis, 
with other harsh known drugs at the time as a tactic for his unknown personal endeavors. Potentially, Nixon could have privately made a deal by, sorry, made a deal by shifty business strategies to create a monopoly by excluding one of the only main <coughs> contenders that could compete for business with cotton and tobacco industry. Motive in this situation would have been rather straightforward without spending millions to retrofit the new equipment and current cotton business. Back in the days, Nixon's cotton industry feared the introduction of legal, legal hemp would kill its business. Big tobacco was no different for other reasons. Big tobacco was legalized, yet another harmful and life-threatening product that has been known to cause addiction and kill like alcohol. All excuses about black market or private sale should be considered laughable when talking about cannabis. My reason is this. Citizens should be considered, or sorry, uh, citizens in New Hampshire and many states across America have the right to create alcohol in their own residence. Tobacco is allowed to be smoked, chewed, rolled, and or otherwise consumption, ingestion, and it has been known to kill both and find ways into the hands of children. Decades without illegalization, along with alcohol, both knowingly causing numerous problems such as birth defects, cancer, and other medical issues like liver failure. My whole life, I was raised with the belief in our founding fathers and the way the words were said with conviction, not just on their minds, but in their hearts. They stood for the people, not the system. That conviction has been lost in the masses of those not able to live with the failures and disappointments to a point of lying, cheating, stealing, and bullying just to win or get what they want. With these being the standards and acceptable practice in today's political gambit, our forefathers foresaw the leadership of England potentially rearing its vile offspring for our children to battle. Their foresight and wisdom can be seen in a passage that they made within our Declaration of Independence made on July 4th in the year 1776. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and provide new guards for their future safety. My mother continues to inspire me throughout my life with her battles. One of many examples my mother has left in mine and other people's hearts is fighting the racism our society has recently heaped onto the backs of our African-American citizens. When I was about nine years old, we moved into a section of town of Breckenridge, which was referred to in a racist manner, so much to a point that even the US Postal Service of the town engaged in that racism by refusing to deliver mail to my own teacher and our town teacher. Mrs. Wilson, a middle school teacher for the town, couldn't get her mail delivered on her street. Two months later, later, my mother set an example for me and our entire town. They got mail, so did we all. Over the years, our presidents have made examples to the rest of our politicians to try and shape their candidacy, to emulate, emulate each muse they are pandering to. I can bet so many politicians said to the first medical patient of New Hampshire, so many times, we are working on it. If I get it in, I'll push for it. California realized and legalized cannabis in 1996 in an act of compassion New Hampshire took until 2013 to do for stage three lung cancer patient <coughs> Linda Haran, leaving her a few short months of reduced suffering with her family. When cannabis is a, uh, is a topic associated with politics, it's like asking who wants to take out the trash in a frat house. Everyone is responsible for it, no one wants to touch it. And I'm sure it has to be hard to be the signature that puts drugs in the streets in the earth, in the streets you represent. But it's the same way of thinking that led to the opioid crisis in America. If you treat someone like a child, they are most likely going to act like a child. When medications are unavailable or overly controlled, individuals or citizens have no actual reason to practice self-restraint, self-control, or self-awareness. Sure, it's hard and scary to make the cannabis signature behind so long a line of vetoes in the past. 
We are supposed to be the next generation not simulating the accepted, most spoken of successes, but actually getting smarter, <coughs> more humane, and actually standing out for something unique and better. No, I'm not a soldier, but it certainly has to be hard as hell to get on a bus, a plane, or a boat for politicians whose signatures decide your fate, mortality, every day and night, and even the fate of your families. What happens when your vets and your citizens see you as too hard to get behind? I have a lot more page and there's a lot more important people than me to speak. I'll donate the rest of my paperwork if there are any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there any question? Seeing none, I thank you for your testimony. <coughs> thank you. I'd like to call Mark Sisti. Interest in this matter. Good afternoon. Excuse me, sir. Would you like to leave your testimony with us? Yes, I will in just a moment. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Sisti. Uh, I live in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. In July of 1979, I took the New Hampshire bar exam to this very building. Would you mind speaking into the microphone? Yeah. I think it's, I think it's not close enough to, to, to you. Close no. to you. How's that? Better? Yeah, I took the bar exam in this very building. And uh, I was honored for the last 41 years to be a member of the New Hampshire Bar, <coughs> as well as the Vermont Bar. And I've been a criminal defense attorney for those 41 years. I've had the uh, wonderful experience of practicing in several states. And in fact, you already heard from one of my law partners that I, I worked with, Paul Toomey, earlier. <coughs> a lot of the things I've already wanted to say have been said. But let me emphasize a few things. The real problem with marijuana in the state of New Hampshire, the problem that we have is that it is illegal. That is the problem. It's almost amusing to think about a law student at Harvard growing four plants, a law student at the University of Maine growing four plants, a law student at the University of Toronto growing four plants, a law student or a medical student in Vermont growing four plants, and a law student in New Hampshire growing four plants. The difference is that the law student in New Hampshire is caught growing four plants, gets to have a criminal conviction on his or her record, and probably will not be admitted to a bar. So it's not only that we are an island, prohibition. <coughs> We're an island that is denying rights and benefits to a lot of our youth and a lot of our citizens. And I think we have to come to grips with that. Now you heard from Attorney Toomey earlier and he was describing, you know, little vignettes about speaking with police officers and asking police officers if they ever got in a fight with a guy that was high. Well, I've been doing this for 41 years. Paul did it for 35. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And I, I really would suggest that if you have questions about what really is going on out there, that I encourage you to ask me those questions. I speak to people every day, every day, that are chastised, that have come into my office to get records and know because of criminal convictions concerning marijuana. Concerning marijuana. These are just regular people. Regular, normal folks. Your friends. Maybe your relatives. Maybe your kids' friends. Maybe your kids are all subjecting themselves to criminal conviction in New Hampshire when they could go to Boston, Massachusetts, or Burlington, Vermont, or Montreal, or Portland, Maine, and do the same behavior they're doing in New Hampshire. Now, there's been a lot of talk about how ridiculous and foolish and senseless this is. It truly is. I mean, it, 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 you're encouraging, you're encouraging 
our citizens to travel out of state to purchase and enjoy what they want to do without fear of police intervention. Why is it, when you think about it, why is it? Why are we subjecting our citizens to that anxiety, that fear, and that possible incarceration when our neighbors do not? What makes us so special that we want to lock up our citizens? What makes us so special that we want to put a black mark on their record? Because the Harvard Law student that's growing four plants isn't worried about the police and isn't worried about gaining access to the Massachusetts bar or any bar in the United States. But the kid down the street from here at the University of New Hampshire is worried. Is worried and should be. It makes absolutely no sense. As far as marijuana being a problem, that's not your problem in this day. I mean, ask anybody in law enforcement. We all know who it is and what it is. I mean, the elephant in the room right now is fentanyl and opiates. And everybody knows that. People don't come into my office bemoaning the fact that their child is addicted to marijuana. I don't go to trials in courtrooms throughout the state of New Hampshire because of marijuana offenses. People aren't dying because of marijuana. People aren't held up at ma and pa stores at late at night because of marijuana. None of that's happening. So I'd say, you know, take the myth away. Take a look at the reality of what's going on out there. And I can assure you, as somebody that practices in New Hampshire and Vermont, Vermont, a legal, a legal state, has no increase in <coughs> DUIs. There's been no increase. You haven't heard those stories because they don't exist. Canada isn't shutting down their highways because of DUIs. Because legalization there didn't create a problem. The folks that are smoking or utilizing marijuana today in an illegal state are going to be the same folks that are using it when it's legal. And you know, you can make predictions about all kinds of things, who's going to win the Super Bowl and everything else, okay? There is no question, none whatsoever, that sooner or later, sooner or later, New Hampshire will come to the senses and legalize marijuana. I mean, I pray that it's sooner. And unlike folks that uh, treat drug-addicted individuals as their business, I represent individuals charged with crimes. I'm speaking against my monetary interests when I'm discussing this matter with you. I'm, I'm telling you the way it is. If I was telling you that I had a financial benefit in this, I'd say make everything clean. But this is just absolutely foolish, and it has been for the last 41 years that I've been practicing. I would appreciate any questions that you have. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I want to tell you, I apologize for not putting you together with uh, your partner. No, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much you. for your testimony. Boris Grappier. Cheyenne Harding. I noticed that you have 10 to 15 minutes written on your card. I would appreciate you keeping it to two or three minutes. Thank you. Try to speed read. It's Pardon a, me? I'll try to speed read, I guess, or summarize. It's a life story. Not literally, but story about my life relating to this bill. All right. Maybe you could pull the microphone a little closer. Hi, my Hi. name is Cheyenne Harding. Is that good? Um, I'm here to speak in pro of HB 1648. 
Um, I do have two copies for you guys to read, so I'll try to keep it quick. Um, House Bill 1648, relative to the home cultivation of cannabis, ought to pass because we are all Americans. I say this simply because as an American, I was taught growing up in public schools right here in New Hampshire that Thomas Jefferson once wrote in the first draft of the Declaration of Independence that as an American, we all have unalienable rights, of which are the preservation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As a New Hampshire resident, I feel that House Bill 1648 allows me to preserve a way of life that I have begun to call my own. Before I began using cannabis, I had no faith or hope in this world ever changing. I was being consumed by debilitating conditions such as anhedonia, chronic depression lasting over a period of time where I hadn't been able to experience happiness in the same way as others anymore. Um, I began using cannabis as a way to deal with my serious sui suicidal ideations um, along with my depression and PTSD. Being autistic, I never had any urges to make or keep friends. Socialization was completely out of the question and paired with depression and PTSD, family eventually became similar to strangers. This is very hard for me. I stand or sit here before you today as a humble New Hampshire citizen who understands the difference between a life filled with loneliness, anti-socialization, pain, and a life who has been granted an opportunity to start anew. I am currently a New Hampshire cannabis medical patient and can proudly say that I have not had suicidal thoughts for an elongated period of time and my depression has seemingly lessened. Cannabis allowed me to become more friendly uh, and less guarded, allowing me to make more friends, socialize normally, enjoy life, and pursue newly found dreams. <coughs> I mention all of this because this slowly allowed me to repair a highly damaged relationship with my sister who I've had a damaged relationship with since 10 and a half years old due to her many suicidal attempts when I was nine and a half years old. Many of my dreams still to this day are waking up covered in her blood because she carved her arms. The reason I go into such detail about my PTSD is because it is to my educational belief to this day that my sister's many suicidal attempts were in association with my mother's alcoholism and her own inability to cope with feeling alone in a world where she herself wasn't old enough or ready for my mom not to be a mother. Alcoholism, alcoholism took that choice from my mother until she nearly lost her life to the battle. She was given two weeks to live before she signed herself into rehab. The same day my mother stopped drinking is the day my sister stopped cutting. They shared that anniversary for many years. I mention all of this because my next point refers to the phrase liberty and how I believe House Bill 1648 creates a state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed by authority on one's way of life, behavior, or political views. Alcohol destroyed my family. It destroyed parts of me emotionally, and to this day, the very smell of it sends me into physical shakes. I feel it is my liberty to have a choice to both use cannabis medicinally, but also recreationally, as HB 1648 <coughs> refers to granting every adult New Hampshire resident the liberty to have a choice in how they reduce stress or relax within their life at home residence. I believe it is oppressive of my authorities, the current New Hampshire law, and those who make or change them or refuse to change them to disallow recreational cannabis use for adult age of 21 years or older, yet alcohol remains legal to make and use in New Hampshire. I should not be forced to go without cannabis, which has many proven medicinal properties and very few medicinal setbacks in comparison to alcohol, especially when you compare them over time. Uh, I'm free to questions, because I know you want me to keep it short. It's a three-page thing. I go into how it affects my pursuit of happiness. But I guess if you guys have questions, I'll take them now. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I thank you for your testimony. Are you going to leave us happy? Huh? Yeah, you leave us a copy of your testimony? Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to call Ian Freeman. Hello, everybody. Good, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for paying attention. And thank you for the great questions so far. Um, I've been coming to these hearings for probably more than a decade. 
now, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion. There's been a lot of really good points made over all the years, and one thing that is significantly different about today's hearing is there's not, I don't think I've seen anyone from law enforcement here. And I've come to these hearings for a long time, and there's almost always at least a couple of cops, the chiefs of police and other... Uh, there actually was somebody from law enforcement who supports the bill. That's wonderful to hear. I, I didn't mean to include Rick Van Wickler. He's been a long time opponent of, uh, of prohibition. I mean the, the usuals. Um, they're not here, and I think that's a really good sign. I think that's, that tells me at least that maybe they're giving up on this issue. We didn't hear them trot out uh, the many lies that, and misinformation that have been uh, proliferated over the years, so I'm grateful for that. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about my history. I've had a long history with cannabis. Uh, I discovered it when I was 16 years old, and I was fully uh, indoctrinated with the Drug Abuse Resistance Education, the D.A.R.E. program, where they had told me that cannabis was uh, tantamount to heroin, and that it was all the same, that all drugs were the same, they were all bad and very dangerous. And when I found out that that wasn't true, when I first tried cannabis for the first time at age 16, that made me wonder what else it was that the government had been lying to me about. And it uh, definitely led me to fear the police. It led me to not consider the police to be friends, uh, but instead a you know, very dangerous group of people that could hurt me and could hurt my friends. And in many cases, they have done that. Uh, my life would not have been made better if I had been arrested at that time when I was 16 or 17 or 18 or any of those years. It would not have made my life better if I had been just given a ticket and then forced into the court system or forced, forced into some sort of a government uh, so-called justice system. That doesn't make a teenager's life better. And I think that's, that leads me to one of the, the problems with this bill, and I support the bill. You know, if you pass this as is, it'll be a great step in the right direction, so I want to be clear on that. Um, but it treats young people as though they are children, and they're not. Um, especially 18, 19, and 20 year olds, these are fully legal adults, but this bill still treats them like criminals for making a decision that they are absolutely able to make and have been making for many decades, which is to consume cannabis, um, as I did at that age. And you know, now we're seeing so many more options. I think some folks touched on the, the edibles. Um, when I started smoking cannabis at uh, 16, all there was was smoked cannabis. That was the only option. If you ran into an edible, it was a very rare occasion that you happened to you know, meet somebody who had the knowledge of how to cook with, uh, with cannabis. It was very, very rare that that would happen. So all we could do was smoke. And now there are better options. Now there is vaping. And I, some people mentioned the concerns with vaping. I think it should be pointed out that the only issues that have happened with vaping were with black market THC vapes, meaning vape cartridges that were sold illegally on the black market. So we wouldn't see those problems with a, with a legal marketplace. I know this bill doesn't create a legal marketplace, and uh, that's another issue. But I uh, just wanted to say that we do have better options today. And personally, I've stopped smoking cannabis because of the various different edibles that are available now. Um, and that has made my life better because honestly I've never really wanted to inhale uh, smoke, but it led to a certain effect that, that I desired. And now I can get that by simply uh, eating. And that does lead me to another critique I have of the bill, and that is the 300 milligram limit is dramatically low. It's actually surprisingly low. Uh, three quarters of an ounce is a fair amount of cannabis that might last someone like me who's a regular consumer of it. Um, something like a month. Uh, 300 milligrams of uh, edibles probably wouldn't be a week if I go through 40 milligrams a, a day, for instance. So that's a you know, very small number. There's no reason that number shouldn't have an extra zero on it or be eliminated entirely. In fact, I think that would make this bill a lot better. I realize you guys have to take baby steps, and this was another step after the, uh, the initial deep crim back in 2017. But ideally, um, if we're all adults, and I think we are, the difference between three quarters of an ounce and a full ounce is really insignificant. And I know that, I remember when the three quarters of an ounce number was proposed a few years ago, it was done as like a, a deal to assuage the police. And the police always come in and they say that, well, they're trying to protect the children. So we're protecting the children from a full ounce, but not for three quarters of an ounce. I mean, it's just, it's silly, it's completely arbitrary. So I would say the best bet would be to get rid of any kind of limits for adult possession 
and also to allow younger people uh, in this bill. So change it from 21 to 18, if not get rid of it entirely. Also, like uh, nobody's suggesting <coughs> that people under the age of 18, the only punishment should be that their parents are informed about this. Please don't put young people into the, uh, the justice system. I've known young people who've been through the New Hampshire juvenile court system, and it has not made their lives better. It has been just a terrible experience. So again, it presumes that there's still something dangerous or something wrong uh, with cannabis, and there isn't. This is a plant, and it's safe for young people um, as well. In fact, many uh, people who are taking it medically are young, and it's a miracle uh, for them. I have a, a friend of mine who was never really a cannabis user in any significant way. He used it <coughs> on occasion, but he has quit drinking alcohol now because of cannabis vapes. He never really enjoyed smoking cannabis, but he found that the vape cartridge uh, that he tried out, he takes one, I think one, hit off of the vape cartridge, and he has no desire to drink at night anymore. It has changed his life uh, in that way. So I know a lot about the black marketplace. I know a lot about cannabis. And uh, if, I, if you have any questions, I'm happy to field them. And I appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you. Sorry, no, thank you very much. The last person we have a card for is Matt Simon. Chair, Honorable Committee, for the record, my name is Matt Simon. I live in Manchester, and I've been advocating for cannabis policy reform in New Hampshire since 2007, when I founded the New Hampshire Coalition for Common Sense Marijuana Policy. I now work for the Marijuana Policy Project, which is a national nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to ending cannabis prohibition in all 50 states and federally. Um, a number of you have heard from me many times over the years, so I've taken a somewhat more uh, environmentally friendly approach today. I'm only giving you a few pieces of paper. Uh, they have a lot of footnotes. I'm also publishing a version of this on the web. I will send the link around, so if you want to click through uh, sometime over the weekend and read some of these articles that are supplied for you, uh, you'll be able to do that <coughs> later this afternoon. So first of all, I would I support the bill, and we've heard a lot of talk about cannabis today. I would stress that this bill, in my opinion, is not so much about cannabis as it, itself as it is about the role of government in people's lives. Uh, we've already heard a lot of testimony along those lines. Now that public opinion has shifted so overwhelmingly in favor of legalization, we're currently expecting law enforcement officers in this state to punish adults and in some cases arrest them and have them prosecuted for doing something that two thirds of the population does not believe should be illegal. And I encourage you to think about that as you deliberate on this bill. We've now had two polls in a row in New Hampshire that show 68% support for legalization. And if you look at the, the first uh, one pager that's provided uh, it shows that cannabis legalization is actually more popular than any elected official <laughs> in New Hampshire. 78% uh, of Democrats, 74% of independents, 56% of Republicans, and 81% uh, of 18 to 34 year olds, 81% of 35 to 49 year olds, 59% of 50 to 64 year olds, and even 49% of 65 and over with only 45% posed. So for the first time in March of last year, a plurality of people over 65 in New Hampshire support legalization. That matches with the national polls, the Gallup poll, 66%. So we have a bill here that is similar in some ways to bills you've seen previously, but minus everything that was complicated, the regulation and the taxation. Uh, 
easy to get bogged down in those details. How should it be regulated? Should we sell it in liquor stores or private retailers? Should the tax rate be 5% or 10% or 20% or no percent? And this bill is an attempt to look at this issue simply from a criminal justice and civil liberties perspective and to answer a very simple question. Should adults in New Hampshire be punished for their choice to use cannabis? And I would argue that that answer is affirmatively no. Uh, as others have said, it's not the position, my position or organization's position that cannabis is harmless. It certainly is not harmless. However, fining adults for possession and arresting them, prosecuting them for cultivation does nothing to make anybody safer, whether from cannabis. It only <coughs> further, uh, exacerbates the harms. And if somebody does have a problem with cannabis dependence, and it does exist, it's much less common than, than alcoholism or uh, other forms of, of drug addiction, but for somebody who does have an issue with cannabis dependence, we argue that the worst thing that we could be doing to that person is putting them into the criminal justice system, fining them uh, if they're growing plants, charging them with a felony, does nothing to address their addiction problem. It's a criminal justice response to a health problem, and that's, the kind of thinking that I hope we're able to get beyond. One aspect of the issue has changed in recent years, which is that every state around us has moved forward. I want to briefly uh, correct some of the previous testimony on that. So cannabis is legal for adults in, in all neighboring jurisdictions. Uh, Massachusetts is the only state that has currently a, a legal regulated market. There are over 30 stores open in Massachusetts. Six of them are within 15 miles of the New Hampshire border, so it's uh, certainly available to anybody who can cross the southern border. Maine, which voters legalized in Maine in the same year Massachusetts did in 2016, but uh, the, the implementation of that uh, regulated market hasn't, hasn't materialized just yet. They're expecting the first stores to be open within the next few months, so at that point, the eastern border will likely be dotted with, with legal cannabis stores. And in Vermont, uh, which was the first state to do this <coughs> legislatively, uh, did not create a regulated market in the initial legislation. This bill is very close to being identical to Vermont's current law. Um, they are currently in the process in the legislature of working on a regulated market bill. Uh, it's passed the Senate already in a vote of 23 to 5. Uh, it's passed the House Committee 10 to 1. But I cannot predict for you whether it will uh, ultimately become law this year or not, uh, but certainly retail sales are happening in Canada, happening in Massachusetts, on their way to happening in Maine, and, and likely to be happening soon in Vermont. So what that means for people in New Hampshire, uh, I've been saying for years that anybody who wants cannabis in New Hampshire already has access to it, but for whatever small minority people didn't already have access, they can now drive and to Lowell or to Salisbury, Massachusetts, which is right across the border from Seabrook, or to Gardner, Massachusetts, or uh, they're, they're, they're kind of scattered along the northern border, but anybody who has cash in their pocket can go to Massachusetts, buy cannabis, and return with it. So should we be fining people? Is that an adequate, uh, smart use of criminal, limited criminal justice resources? I argue that the vast majority of people would say no. So I'm going to turn to a few of the comments and questions that have been raised. Uh, so first of all, Kate Fry mentioned uh, a gifting loophole. At least she was the only person that testified against the bill. And it sounded like most of her objections were based on certain details, one of them being this gifting loophole. So if we look at page two, uh, lines 32 to 37. This is addressed very clearly and explicitly in the bill. Uh, it says, transferring three quarters of an ounce, five grams of hashish, cannabis infused products, dot, 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 <coughs> to a person 21 years of age of older without remuneration. And that's uh, in, in a section that says, these things are now legal, shall not be illegal under New Hampshire law. So it is not illegal to transfer as long as there is no remuneration. And then by way of clarifying that, 
For purposes of this subparagraph, a transport is for <coughs> remuneration if cannabis is given away contemporaneously with another transaction between the same parties, as in the purchase of a t-shirt or a $100 bottle of juice uh, or, or whatever <coughs> thing that somebody might be doing in Washington, D.C., uh, because this loophole does exist in Washington, D.C. People are buying $100 t-shirts and having cannabis arrive at their doorstep along with a $100 t-shirt. And that is so. <coughs> so this sentence is in the law to make sure that any way that somebody might be selling cannabis is definitely still illegal. So I hope that will somewhat appease that objection from the futures. Um, we heard about employers, uh, and I want to stress the bill on page five. Uh, this is part of the section that says, nothing in this section shall, that's at the bottom of page four, but there's a list of things on five, page five, and one of those things is nothing in this section shall uh, be construed to require an employer to permit or accommodate the use, consumption, possession, transfer, display, transportation, sale, or growth of cannabis in the workplace, or to affect the ability of employers to have policies restricting the use of cannabis by employees. So from the perspective of employers, this changes nothing. They're allowed to have policies that say you can't be impaired at work. They'll be allowed to have those policies if this bill passes. We heard from uh, both Mr. Freeman and uh, Mr. Nobody, I'll call him Mr. Nobody, for lack of knowing what uh, appellation to, to give him, um, about the criminalization of children and the idea that, that children would be subjected to criminal penalties under this law. And what I'd like to point out is <clears throat> that this law actually doesn't change anything at all uh, for people who are under 21, that while we were negotiating the decrim legislation that passed in 2017, there were a number of meetings between advocates and opponents about what would be the most sensible way to handle cannabis possession for under 21, and that's a re reflected in the existing law. You can see it in, in the text of this uh, bill. Um, but for somebody who is 18, under 18, so 17 or under, this is page four, line eight, any person under 18 who's convicted uh, shall forfeit the cannabis and shall be subject to a delinquency petition under RSA 169 B6. That's not a criminal sanction. It's, it's an option to, I'm not an expert on, on the juvenile justice system, but it's certainly not a criminal sanction. And then for a person who is 18, 19, or 20, uh, the previous decrim statute would still be applying uh, to those, those folks. So it would be decriminalized, it would be a fine of $100 for a first or second offense for somebody who is 18, 19, or 20. That's appropriate. We're certainly not trying to legalize for uh, under 21 in this bill. That would be a non-starter given that the legal age is, is 21 for alcohol, but it maintains the existing decrim framework that was worked out between, or at least agreed to as a compromise between advocates and opponents. Uh, finally, impaired driving, uh, having worked closely with the Vermont legislature uh, leading up to their passage of a very similar bill and now law, the by far number one concern that people had, uh, the biggest concern stated by Governor Phil Scott by his uh, uh, Department of State commissioner was impaired driving. They, they were very concerned that there would be a massive uptick in impaired driving in Vermont and uh, that, that bill took effect uh, July a year and a half ago. Um, so actually in, in uh, 2019, the first full year the legalization was in effect, uh, they were surprised to see a reduction. Uh, it was a full 30% reduction in road fatalities. I'm not going to tell you that, that was caused by cannabis legalization. I will tell you that that was their biggest concern and it certainly didn't materialize in the road fatalities. Uh, and I can send around a link 
on that as well. Uh, they did have a, an increase in the number of people who were arrested for D DWI uh, with cannabis being involved, and that's likely attributable to the fact that they've been training law enforcement. They have more uh, drug recognition experts than they used to. There's been an emphasis from the top down, from the governor and the, the safety commissioner, on impaired driving. So police seem to be looking for it more, and they're being encouraged to charge for it. Uh, in the past, it's so much easier to get an alcohol conviction. I've heard this from a number of attorneys because you have the breathalyzer. So if somebody's got both alcohol and you think they've been using cannabis too, often police will just go for the alcohol conviction because it's so much easier to get. So this, this increase in arrests may, you know, it likely has nothing to do with an actual increase in use or people driving. Uh, it likely is entirely explained by the fact that police are looking more closely and are being better trained to identify signs of cannabis impairment and are being encouraged to bring the case as a, a multi-substance case. So I believe uh, I think I did everything on my list and we've already been here for a long time and I usually have a lot more to respond to because there's a lot more opposition testimony. But this bill is about whether adults should be punished in New Hampshire. 68% of them think they shouldn't be. If they're crying this possession. Uh, like others, I wish some aspects of this bill went further than they do. However, this would be an important step forward and incremental change and reform is, is often the only way to get anything at all done. So, thank you. Happy thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Abbas, thank you. question. Can you take my question? It's only going to be one question. I tend to agree with the, some of what the previous witness was testifying to about the 300 milligrams in, in edible. And I'm just curious your opinion on that, that provision because my concern is that someone who's home growing who then were to make an edible, they, have no, they don't really have a real way of knowing how much, um, how, how many, how much milligrams are inside that. So it might just, I don't want someone accidentally violating this provision for that reason. Do you have any thought on that or any information you can provide? Um, so if somebody's growing at home, they're allowed to possess the cannabis that comes from the plants. If they were then to create edibles from the plants that they grew, when they stored the edibles, uh, they, they would be not violating the possession limit. The possession limit applies when they leave the house, the three quarters of an ounce or 300 milligrams. Uh, and that's actually the one difference in this bill, really from the decrim framework. Uh, the decrim statute, the current law, only applies to edible products that were purchased in another state. So if you're coming back with your Massachusetts brownies, it's going to be labeled right there what the milligrams are. That was something New Futures felt strongly about including in the decrim law, so it was included, despite my thinking it was pretty silly. Um, I would be all for getting rid of the limit. Adults in New Hampshire can have wine cellars, they can have liquor cabinets, they can brew lots and lots of beer. These are arbitrary limits. But that's more a reflection of people being comfortable with this transition. And you know, we've heard often in the past uh, testimony suggesting that one plant can produce a gazillion pounds of cannabis and that for every pound of cannabis, somebody can roll eight bazillion joints out of it. And these are talking points that were designed to scare people into thinking that something terrible would be happening if we allow adults to grow a few of their own plants. So it's reflective of compromise, and it's an attempt to maintain as much of the existing decrim framework uh, that, is, that is already part of the law. Now, from a law enforcement perspective, I would hope, I would hope that only egregious cases, somebody's got a trunk load of edibles. If somebody has got, there's evidence that they're very likely dealing, that they're plainly in excess, <coughs> that person would be arrested and charged. But somebody who appears to only have a personal use amount, whether it's 0.72 ounces or 0.78 ounces, I would hope the law enforcement would use discretion, which they certainly are entitled to do, and not waste the taxpayers' money, not waste a court's time with that type of case. So if they see that you have a lot of edibles, 
They could arrest you, they could have the crime lab process and find out exactly how many milligrams. But my goodness, I would hope they would only do that if there's an actual you know, likelihood that this person is not a consumer and is in fact trying to be in the business. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Is there anybody here who has not spoken who would like to speak? Did you read the blue sheets? Thank you very much for your testimony, everybody. Uh, we have only one person signing in uh, opposing the bill. We have one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen people signing in in favor of the bill. Um, signing in in favor of the bill, Representative Kevin Craig, Representative Wendy Chase, uh, Paul Warseritz from Concord, uh, Richard Van Winkler, Bill Alleman, uh, Daniel Stodwell, Lisa Powers, Bryn Slattery, Alessandra Murray, Marie Parati, Cheyenne Harding, Joseph Brooks, Senator Martha Hennessy, Lynn Steckhouse, uh, Ann Glazebook. Uh, signing in against the bill was Elizabeth Sargent from the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police. Um, signing in for the bill, Representative Steve Woodcock and Representative Patty Lovejoy. Thank you very much. I will conclude this hearing. Thank you all very much for coming. So Tuesday we'll be executing on a, a lot of bills. Everybody read up over the weekend and get ready. And this will be one of them.